Um, I kind of wish the coffee break came after that talk because I'm not sure how you follow um, something so serious. But just coming on stage, I kind of realized that the topic I'm going to talk about is quite related, but I'm going to come at it from a very different angle. Um, and in my role, I'm very fortunate that I have the time to think about the past, present, and future of technology. And in particular, I think a lot about the role technology should play in bettering humanity, and I stress should. Um, and what I'd like to do in this talk is go through some examples. It'll be a little bit of a lighter tone compared to the last talk, but I'm going to go through, through some examples, uh, giving you a sense of how technology is developed today and maybe some of the things that are not quite right about the approach. And I'd like to give some counterexamples based on work we've done with the artistic community to show you that there might be a different way. And I'm not trying to say that this is a better way. All I want to do is show you that there can be a different perspective, a different approach to how you integrate technology, how technology can be used to better humanity. And really what I want to do is throw out a challenge to everyone in the room. If you're a technologist, an engineer, a researcher who develops technology, I'd like you to think about your role in this process and how you should be developing technology that betters humanity. All of us as, <laughs> thank you, I appreciate that. All of us as consumers of technology, forget if you're an artist, a technologist, as consumers, we shouldn't just accept what's given to us. We should question everything. We've completely lost that ability in modern humanity. It's very disappointing. Um, and I'll go through some examples of where we should absolutely not accept what's given to us. Um, and then finally, I'd like to throw out the biggest challenge to the artistic and creative community in the room, because I think, I'm a trained engineer, by the way, just so you know, for background and context, I think you can play the biggest role in bettering humanity, but by you inserting your perspective into the tech community. And I'll give examples about why this is critically important, and I'll try and share my perspective on why there's a big difference between the two worlds, but when you bring them together in the right way, it's very powerful. So um, if you like this kind of work, my Twitter handle is there. Uh, I work for Nokia Bell Labs. If someone wants to ask what that even means nowadays, uh, please do so in the questions or at lunchtime. So just to start off for fun, here's an example of a product that's made the rounds in the popular media at the moment. This piece of technology you place around your mouth, and it's meant to allow you to speak at high volume when you're in a public area like an open office. Now, do you think this is humanizing technology or dehumanizing technology? <laughs> okay, let's go for an even funnier one, in my opinion. This is an iPhone case where you hold your fork and your spoon. Okay, so it's a little bit silly on the face of it, but let's, let's look at how they expect you to use this technology. They expect you to consume your food while you're consuming your digital content. Now, this has won awards, right? And they call this innovation. Now, I don't, I'm not going to go into my thoughts on what innovation is and what innovation is not. I'll happily talk about it for hours with any of you after the talk. I'm not going to go into it in this talk. But for me, this is absolutely not innovation. And this is the opposite to humanizing technology. I actually think this is complete and utter nonsense. And as a technologist, as someone that loves technology, this really disappoints me. Because technology is so much more potential to better humanity, and we're wasting a lot of money, a lot of people's time, a lot of resources on this kind of complete and utter nonsense. So what I'd like to do is, I'm going to go through some of the major kind of buzzy, hyped up technology trends of our time. And I'd like to give some examples about the way the technology is being developed today. And I'd like to give some counterexamples in ways we've worked with the artistic community. And again, please understand, I'm not trying to say our approach is better. It's just different. And I really want to provoke a discussion around uh, these different approaches. So VR, AR, MR, XR, all of these topics. We've heard an awful lot about it uh, throughout the last couple of days. You know, from my perspective, this is what I see, for the most part, excluding a couple of recent, really nicely put together pieces of hardware with good content. But this is what uh, virtual reality is. And uh, from a technologist's point of view, actually, this is where we're likely to go. <laughs> All right? OK, I'm trying to bring a bit of humor to it. But I actually, this really upsets me that there are people that are trained in engineering and the sciences that will develop this kind of thing and bring it to the world. So this is an example of how technologists typically, and I'm 
painting broad strokes here for sure. Not every technologist thinks like this, but for the most part, a lot of them do. This is how the typical approach to technology is today. Um, VR, okay, it was, it was the buzziest of buzzy things in the last 10 years. It pretty much went nowhere. We just saw very good examples of where it can be very compelling. But for the most part, from a consumer point of view, where is VR, what is it? Who cares, right? So now it's all about AR, right? Augmented reality. That's the next big investment hype cycle. Someone has to get the returns from their investment. So it's all about AR. But this is what really worries me about AR. And we've seen some very good examples of how AR can be used positively. And I take those, and I understand those, and I really appreciate those. But I want to give a sense of how AR can be used um, in a really bad way. And in my opinion, I think what I'm about to show you is a very fair prediction of how we will be forced to consume augmented reality and possibly the next variants after that. Estoy libre de mi ira. Estoy libre de mi tristeza. Y el amor es mi So, I strongly believe that this is a very fair prediction of in the next five years what might be forced upon us. Because if you think about how our attention and our time and our existence is monetized today by a number of companies, can you possibly argue with me that this is not what they will do to us in the next five years? I, I honestly, how, and how are we going to break this cycle, right? How are we going to make, use this technology for the betterment of humanity, not for this complete and utter nonsense? This is completely dehumanizing. And we should never accept this. And we should question this. So as a counterexample, to some of the more dystopian ways that VR and AR can be used. Um, we've done work with an artist called Lisa Park, and she's very interested in how you connect people in a more human way and how you make visible those invisible interactions between humans that make us human, that differentiate us from the machines and from the animal world. And this particular piece is called Blooming. And what, with Lisa, what we were really interested in doing was exploring the importance of physical touch between people and between people in the physical world. And we want to explore and provoke thinking in the fact that in modern times, we've almost completely lost that thing that makes us most human. Because we touch our phones more than we touch anything or anyone else in our world. And it's um, quite depressing. So in this piece, and again, this is an example of something I as an engineer or any of my colleagues globally as engineers never could have come up with. This uses sensor technology in a very simple way to determine how people physically touch. I'm going to show you a video. They enter into a space, and when they enter into a space, there is a cherry blossom in its unblossomed state. And two or more people have to physically touch, hold hands, hug, kiss, whatever. And the sensor technology detects that. And when they make physical contact, the cherry blossom grows in front of them. And this is presented on a holographic gauze material, so it's kind of got that 3D effect. So I'll show a little video here of it. The quality isn't spectacular, but you'll get the point. At one place. Gotcha. Yeah. OK, well, I'm going to stand right oh. here. And so we're all standing. And then what happens? What's next? It's uh, just any physical interaction. So let's say if we are holding hands, sure. like skin to skin oh, contact. Wow. So it's hard to um, get this across, obviously, through a video and a presentation. But what we had was a stunning reaction to this piece, where we showed this at South by Southwest a couple of months ago, and we showed it again last year in a different venue. But people actually broke down and cried. We had families, couples, even complete strangers that that made them realize the power of this when you bring art and technology together in the right way is that it provokes you to think about things that you take for granted. And it made people realize that we've actually lost um, one of these things that are most critical to the human condition, which is physical touch, physical interaction, physical proximity, because we've virtualized everything. So that's just one counterpoint. I'm not saying it's better, um, but I just want you to think about how, when you bring art and technology together, there's a very different approach. OK, another big buzzy thing at the moment is haptics. Uh, haptics is where you can simulate a touch via vibrations or heat or any of these other types of concepts. And it's really important in VR or AR because without what that, what's called that chain of persuasion, 
without your brain getting that extra sensory input where you feel your feet on the ground or you feel the air moving by you or you feel the heat of the room, your brain will not be immersed in that virtual experience. So you need this chain of persuasion, which could be haptics or spatial audio, in order to have the brain feel more immersed in these virtual environments. And haptics is one of these things where when you're in that virtual environment, whether it's AR or VR, you can actually start feeling, physically feel some of these virtual uh, elements. And here's again examples of the technology. And I'm not taking examples from 10 years ago, I'm taking examples from today. Massive uh, hype around investment in haptics technology. And again, I'd argue that this is dehumanizing. You know, why is this kind of technology being forced upon us? And why will we accept it? So this is the approach of today. And of course, now we link clunky VR headsets with clunky haptics gloves, and what are we left with? We're digital zombies. So it's like the digital zombie apocalypse that might be forced upon us, and then we're gonna be forced to consume all of this nonsense um, advertising that we're gonna to have to be charged somehow through our existence. And I just don't think this is right. So we work with artists uh, across a range of technologies, and what I'm about to show you is work we've done with musicians and composers because, would you believe it, we have a vast wealth of knowledge in haptics and how people interact with musical instruments for many, many hundreds and thousands of years. So we want to go back to that, something we know very well, and explore those haptic uh, physical interactions between a person, sometimes subject matter experts, and this piece of technology, which is a traditional instrument, and kind of augment that, experiment with that, explore that, and then get a better sense of what it means to be a human interacting with a different technology, before we start moving on to some of these um, digital types of approaches. So I'll play you a little video here that will give a sense of um, some of the work we've done. Don't worry about the text, it's everything I'm saying to you in words. I came to Bell Labs with three hats, with three roles. I come as a humanist who's deeply interested in the nature of communication. The second is as a technologist who's trying to think about how can I decrease the friction between a thing that allows someone to be expressive and the expressive intent on the other side. The last is as a creative practitioner who wants to find a way to express myself through technology. I've chosen to make today not an end of a process with uh, completed pieces, but to do with the Bell Labs community uh, what I do with musicians and artists when I work with them as a practitioner. Which so I'll just pause there. So what Seth actually has done there with a number, a range of traditional instruments is he created different technologies. So that bassoon, for example, he has a 3D printed insert that is a speaker and a microphone. So when you're playing in an ensemble, you can take the sounds that come from one another instrument and play them through the different instrument live. And when that happens, it actually disrupts how that musician interacts with their instrument that they're an expert on. And through that interruption, it helps augment their creativity because now they have to relearn the instrument. Because in that particular case, when you blow a note out or a pitch out or a sound out from a, another instrument into that bassoon, that actually changes the airflow within the instrument, changes how the mouthpiece is used, and changes how the fingering is used, and it completely has you rethink about that instrument and how you engage with it. And this is just one way that you can think about haptics, that there's a lot of embedded inherent knowledge in what it means to be humans if we think about music, and if we think about how music can transfer emotion, as an example, and there's a lot to be learned there. And I think as technologists, and I know, and I'll talk about this a little bit later, from our training, we tend to go down this reductionist path where all we care about is the technology, and we completely forget about the human at the end of it. And that's basically the whole point of this, is that if you're not thinking about the human, then what is the point? Okay, robotics, of course. Here's your usual pictures. Here is robotics gone wrong. Um, we've worked with an artist called Su Gwen Chung, and she does a lot of interesting work where she collaborates with robotics. And the really nice thing here is that we look to bring the best of humanity with the best of technology and see what we can do together. And I'll play you a short video of some of the work we did with Su Gwen, where she live draws with robotic swarms. But 
what I'd like to explain here is that behind all of this, we learned a lot about data visualization. We learned a lot about the collaboration process between humans and machines. And we actually learned a lot about the fact that if you bring the best of both of them together, you can do so much more than either on their own. And it's not an either or equation, it's a plus equation when it's done right. And that's really important as well. My work to date has been about combining the hand-drawn line and the intuitive gesture with um, different types of algorithms and computational technologies. And that's turned into uh, investigation into human and robot collaboration. Thinking about, you know, what's the next stage of the interface today? I've done a number of things at Bell Lab. In recent years, my work has been in video analytics, and I'm trying to expand the applications from simply public safety to interactiveness and to, to art. I have no expertise in art, and so when the Artists in Residence program at Bell Labs began, I was thrilled because now this was a partnership. I could provide what I knew how to do, and these artists would have new and wonderful and very different ideas than I had even uh, conceived. I became really interested in Larry's background off the bat. He creates visual algorithms that are applied to public cameras and that really triggered my thinking about how I could use that as a way to extract behavior from an urban setting into something that I could paint with. The security cameras have had a long history what I'm doing differently, I'm sort of dumbing down the problem. Instead of looking at each individual out there, I'm looking at crowds. And if something happens, a crowd will react to that collectively. And since it's bigger, video analytics can more reliably recognize that. What I'm doing with Omnia for Omnia is I've collected, I've been calling it the biometrics of the city, but what it essentially is, is the general optical flow of the city through Bell Labs motion engine and I have translated that behavior into robotic movement that functions as a gesturally motion on the canvas. When I first met Su Gwen, I loved the line of her art. So I'll pause it there. So the, the, the learnings we got from working with Su Gwen for over a year, um, they gave us insights into our technology that we never could have happened across on our own, just absolutely not the case. And it's opened up a whole new dimension to how we think about, in this case, video analytics and how we sense people and traffic in, in cities like Boston and New York. And in fact, this is technology we've already deployed to our customers um, for smart city applications, but now we're using it in, in much different, more kind of human ways to try and understand the connections between people. Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit about you know, smartphones and social platforms. Before I do, maybe I'll just take a step back, take a breather, and give a little bit of context about what motivates us to work with artists beyond, obviously, humanizing technology. But in fact, one of the big reasons we work with artists is because we have a vision to create new ways for humans to communicate, um, to be able to share emotions, have deeper understanding, deeper meaning, you could think of it in a buzzy way as uh, developing empathic communications. And the reason for that is that I strongly believe that one of the reasons we have all of these issues in the world today is because of a technology choice humanity made many thousands of years ago. And that technology choice is this. It's this form of communication, the spoken word, the written word. This is a technology choice and it's been really good for knowledge sharing, but in my view it's terrible for emotion sharing. This is not a good way for us to actually more deeply understand each other. And I truly believe this is one of the big reasons why all of this weird stuff is going on in the world today. And I'll explain why I think it's becoming worse and worse as we progress technologically. So if you, if you just take that as a, as a premise, a starting premise, that this is already a terrible way for humans to communicate emotionally, look what we've done in modern times. We've reduced our communication to 140 characters of text with completely trivial, nonsensical emojis. You cannot possibly capture or represent the complexity of my emotional state with a happy face. Okay, it's just not possible. We're far more complex than that. But look what we've done. Now, don't get me wrong. This is super convenient. Um, it's asynchronous, so I don't have to be bothered to communicate with you in real time uh, in reply. So there's benefits of convenience to it. But in that convenience, you might question, are we losing our humanity? 
Um, and that's something I think about a lot, and that's something that, as an engineer working with the artistic community, really helps me probe these kind of things. And I question a lot about how we've changed our existence over many hundreds of thousands of years, and instead of using our fingers that have evolved to interact with the physical world in certain ways and with other people and things, it's just all thumb swipes now. And I think a lot about, obviously, as others do, how we've replaced real physical networks, social networks, with real people, with completely trivial, virtual, fake social networks. And no wonder there's so many problems in the world today, right? How could there not be? We're actually going against what it means to be human quite substantially. Now, I'm a technologist and I love technology, and, but I would question the role of technology for the betterment of humanity. And I, I'm just trying to give you examples to help you think about this as well as consumers, as artists, as technologists. So just to give you a, another counterexample, you know, we have all of our phones, and an artist pointed out to me a few years ago that we are far more intimate with our phones than we are with anyone or anything else in your life. So think about the amount of time per day you spend touching your phone. Now compare that to the amount of time in your day that you spend in, not even in physical contact, but in close proximity to your partner, a family member, a kid, anything, right? It's an order of magnitude more that you're spending with your phone. It's actually shocking when you, act, when you really think about it. And that's the power of art, that it forces you at times to really think about these things. It provokes that deep thinking. And when that artist pointed out to me, it was a, it was a light bulb moment. I was like, shit, I cannot believe that I do that. How have I allowed that to become my existence? So this is the power of art. So as a counterexample, we work with a number of artists. The International Contemporary Ensemble are our ensemble in residence with an artist called Lainey Pfefferman based in New Jersey who helped us develop this concept called Compositions for the Collective. And in this particular piece, it's by an Icelandic composer called Anna Torvis Sotir. So this is a musical ensemble. Uh, this was actually filmed uh, last week at Times Square. But what we did is we invited the audience to have their smartphones become part of the performance. So we activated their smartphones and we sent some of the music from the ensemble to their smartphones so that their smartphone became a loudspeaker and they became an extension of the musical performance, and it helped us try and connect people in this more intimate way through the emotion of music, but also by the fact that they're now trying to use their smartphones for something in a deeper, kind of more meaningful way. Of course, the challenge in Times Square is that it's a horrendously noisy environment. So unfortunately, people had to hold the phones up to their ears to counter that background noise, which is obviously something we would never want. In this type of environment, each of your phones could be activated and we can move different music and sounds to each of your phones individually. You don't even have to take it out of your pocket, but you can become an immersive part of the performance in that way. Okay, AI. Okay, this is the last big kind of macro theme that I'm going to talk about. Everyone's on about AI. Um, I'm personally sick <laughs> about hearing about AI. It's just so buzzy, it drives me crazy. Almost no one knows what they're talking about. Of course, there's this doomsday picture that everyone has about AI, Terminator, and this is even worse. This is robotics plus AI, oh my word. You know, this is just the worst scenario possible. Um, and there's a lot of talk about how, how far should we augment ourselves? I mean, we've been augmenting ourselves from the very dawn of humanity, so I'm not sure that that uh, debate really will go anywhere. And then there's the whole point about, you know, bad data gives bad AI. I'd argue bad humans give ba bad AI. And I'm really, I don't think it's fair on AI or technology that everyone's blaming or talking about AI. AI has no uh, valence or AI actually has no personality. It's not a good thing or a bad thing, but those software developers and those data scientists that are programming AI and giving it the data 
and developing the algorithms, and then they have the cheek to push that absolute junk out onto humanity. And I don't know how much you know about this, but you should read into it. Most of the data sets that feed these algorithms are complete and utter nonsense. They're not representative of humanity at all. It's actually disgusting what some of these people are doing. It gives uh, STEM technology, uh, science, technology, engineering, and mathematics a really bad name. It, it gives tech companies that want to do good a very bad name, and people that have trained in those areas, it really annoys us. I think it's a bad thing, and we should call out these things that are not good for humanity. So as a counterpoint, we worked with an artist called Reaps One. He's a beatboxer, uh, you know, these people that can basically make any sound with their voice. And with him, we explored in a series called We Speak Music, which you can check out online, the creative potential of AI. Because I actually believe AI, when it's developed properly for humanity, I think it can raise us all up, and I truly believe that it can enhance the creati creativity of all of humanity. So in this example, he trains machine learning algorithms how to beatbox. Eventually, those algorithms develop a level of maturity where they can beatbox back to him. And in the series, I won't show it here, but there's this light bulb moment where he hears back the AI system beatbox, and it gives him sounds and techniques that he never did before. He never gave it in training. And this was a light bulb moment on a number of re levels for him. It made him question the uniqueness of his own voice, which is a totally different conversation. But it also made him push him and push his creativity, because now this thing he trained was giving him something back he never gave it. And he's one of the most creative people I know. And I often say, if it can help him be more creative, what could it do for the rest of us? So I think there's a lot of power and positive potential in AI. And I'm really, you know, it's very frustrating to hear all of the negative discourse in the popular media about AI. And I just ask you to think about this a bit more logically. Have different sources. Don't just go along with this hype because a lot of it is complete nonsense, and most people that talk about this, honestly, they have no idea what they're talking about. So what I'd like to do is just share with you, this is the final episode in this documentary series that we developed with Reaps One. And this is where he, this kind of gives you, in a, in a performance sense, a sense of how he trained the AI and how the AI increased in its maturity and how eventually it got to this level that he can collaborate with it. So what you'll see is him in a special room we have in Bell Labs in New Jersey called an anechoic chamber where there's no reverberation and sound. That doesn't really matter in this context. It's just a cool looking room. Um, but then you'll see the AI is represented by this visualization on one of the walls. And if we could bring down the house, house lights, that'd be great.
you get the sense. So you can see how he trains the AI using machine learning techniques and eventually got to this level of performance that he could collaborate with it. And in that collaboration, it helps him be more creative. And as I said, he's one of the most creative people uh, that I've met. So I think this is really inspiring for what AI might, AI might do for the rest of humanity. Um, very quickly, because I'm out of time, very few people mentioned 5G throughout the two days, which I think is interesting. I'm not going to talk at all about 5G because I'm not on a sales pitch for my company. But it's very interesting that 5G is this next big evolution of communication technology that will underpin how everything in the world is connected, whether it's in the physical or the digital. And I think I'd just like to mention it to those of you here to kind of read up on it, understand it a bit more. Again, go beyond the hype, because there's a lot of marketing around 5G at the moment, but there's a lot of substance there, and it is going to help transform humanity in the next few years. And think about how 5G might play an important role in helping you bring your art to the real world and also helping better humanity. So you can, if you're interested in this topic, you, know, you can Google Bell Labs EAT. Uh, the previous project was called We Speak Music. You can just view it online uh, for free, no problem. Um, and then very quickly, this is how I view the difference between engineering and art and what the differences are and why bringing them together is really important. As a trained engineer or scientist, we are absolutely trained to be reductionist. We will start with something big and we'll break it down into the smallest solvable chunk and then we will focus only on that and forget about everything else. And we do this in a very linear and logical way. So you ask me how to go from A to D, I can explain it by going through B and C. And from my perspective, and I'm, again, painting broad strokes, not everyone is like this, but broadly speaking, this is a model that I think captures it. I think the artistic and creative community are almost exactly the opposite. You can start with something tiny and minuscule, and it can become a universe of opportunity. But typically, an artist goes about this in a very, what I would call, divergent or expansionist way. And from our perspective, it can be typically illogical and non-linear. So you ask an artist, how do you go from A to D, and they might pass every other letter in the alphabet and never even mention B or C. So I think this is really interesting. Now, these two worlds can collide, and there can be real tensions, and it can be difficult to bring them together. When it's done in the right way, um, this can be magical. And I think at this interface, is where I see a lot of what I would call true innovation and where I see a lot of opportunity for technology coming together with the arts to better humanity. Um, and I know that's a spectacular animation there. Please don't get distracted by it. <laughs> Took me six months to make that animation. So just to conclude, what I'd like to recap is, and I think I hit a slightly more serious tone in the way I would normally deliver a talk uh, given the previous speaker and the kind of seriousness of that topic. But what I'd like to point out is that I believe that technology has massive potential to better humanity way beyond how we're currently thinking about technology, using technology, how we're consuming technology. I think we're diluting technology's ability to impact humanity positively for a number of reasons. I think a lot of people talk about innovation and creativity and they really don't know what they're talking about. It's more buzzwords. I didn't really talk about that too much here, but I'll happily do that at the break. Um, we're completely missing diversity in STEM. Everyone looks like me, and it's really tiring. Um, so male, pale, and stale is the STEM word, right? I hope I'm not stale yet, but I'm on a path to being stale, no doubt, at some stage. So it's just depressing, and it's completely unnecessary, and we're losing out on so much opportunity to better humanity because we're not bringing in those diverse perspectives. And the last thing, back to the whole purpose of this conference and my title of my talk, is that we're missing these human-centric perspectives. And it's absolutely critical that the technology community engages deeply with the artistic community. And I'm not just talking about a brand activation. And I'm not just talking about a two-week residency, which is common. I'm talking about deep, year-on-year, -year, weekly, daily, collaboration where we become extensions of each other's work. I think that's absolutely critical. And although I didn't have time to go into it here, I have many, many examples of the positive benefits when that is done in the right way. And just with that, I'd like to finish by just throwing out that challenge to you as technologists, engineers, um, developers, think about your role in this and how technology can better humanity. All of us as consumers just don't accept the kind of crap that's given to us, right? We should be smarter than that. 
Let's think about what it means to be an individual and, and humans in general. And especially for this group of people here in the context of the opera where all of these different art forms are brought together, you have to play a critical role in helping us as technologists develop technology for humanity. Without you, we'll keep on doing this the same way over and over and over, and we're just losing so much opportunity. So with that, thank you. It's been great to be here.